be good. Okay, so we are recording. All right, so um, let's see here. Let me pull up my slide to share with everyone. Make sure everybody can see. Um, I hope everyone can see the slide. Everybody good? Let me just do a slideshow. Go ahead and skip that. Okay, so welcome again to this session. Uh, something that's a huge part of my life or always has been is performing. I have a very long history of performing, being part of the Screen Actors Guild and theater, and I've done a lot of shows. Um, I know it sounds weird being a criminologist and victimologist, but I have a huge um, theatrical background. And so I love incorporating role playing and all types of media in any of my classes and what I do think of myself as is I think as a professor who is a performer um, that I think I'm fooling everyone with all my students thinking I know things so I like to incorporate uh, performance so just a little bit of a presentation um, agenda I'm going to first discuss assignments for role-playing for both gender and race courses that can be definitely converted online and then I'm going to discuss assignments for media um, and incorporating those in race and gender courses as well as a variety of other courses and then I'm going to do a brief discussion of rubric issues to be cautious of when you do active learning, especially the role playing assignments that I think are important for everyone to take into consideration. And then I'm going to open up, of course, to questions and I would love to end with sharing. So any of you who are, um, you know, teaching race and or gender courses or any other courses, I'd love to hear what you're doing in terms of role playing in media if I did not discuss something. Um, also, maybe you have assignments that you're thinking about trying to transition online and I would love to hear that as well and brainstorm. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in. Um, something that I actually wasn't aware of until I started working at IUSB is reacting to the past. And I think a lot of us might not have heard of it because it, it stems from historical roots. So Mark Carnes, who is a professor of history at Barnard College in 1990, created Reacting to the Past, RTTP. And Reacting to the Past is an active learning pedagogy. Now, the original version of this pedagogy is kind of extensive. So it can go over like seven weeks of your course. Um, it can even go more into like 10 weeks of your course, but you can modify and there's ways to do so. But what's great and kind of like a summary of it, just so you all understand, um, each student is given a role, all right, in which they dress up and they, they literally come into a trans transform classroom where the classroom is back in this specific time frame and every reacting to the past game is what they call it has a social movement component to it so for example Mary Jane Tracy's Greenwich Village 1913 that focuses on suffrage rights and the suffrage movement um, Kelly McFall and Abigail Perkis focuses on changing the game with title IX gender and college athletes so when we first start seeing women athletes playing sports and things of that nature so they're all assigned and there's various games that will go on throughout the process of, of reacting to the past there's also some micro games that are designed that can be completed in one session but most of the games um, draw out throughout those weeks so your students will assume a role of a historical character and throughout the process, they practice um, written and verbal skills. So there are speeches and ways to do so. They also will learn, obviously, about the historical and social movements and critical thinking, which is great. And the one thing that I really love is the focus on that social movement in society. So usually with reacting to the past, there would be a few lectures in the beginning. So it's more lecture based to kind of get students involved. But what's wonderful about this is you can see in the pictures, there's actually a text that students get that focus on this specific type of game per se. And 
instructors get a manual. So instructors get a role sheet, they get all types of assignments. It's kind of beautifully set up for you. But the wonderful part about it is the game can have a different outcome for any class. So what happens, for example, is um, you might have a student playing a woman in the American Revolution and her victory goal, right? Her goal for those seven weeks is to secure a vote in the New Republic. And then you might have also a rich landowner whose victory goal is to make sure that individual does not secure a vote in the New Republic. And you could also even have a student assigned as an anarchist of the time where they're trying to av avoid having a vote altogether and trying to disband anything. So there are factions that are designed in this role playing. And what's really cool too is um, students will create their own propaganda for voting for this particular set. They can, um, I know students in our campus will write on the like on the sidewalk with chalk, right, to promote their specific victory or game. And the specialized textbooks are amazing for them. And there are way too many to list here for race. So if you're teaching a race and crime course, there are tons on the slavery movement, um, various components. There's a desegregation one for like the 1950s, which is really neat too as well. But what I love about this is that I personally will assign my students a different gender. So I will assign my male students um, as women suffragettes. And I think that that's important to switch roles in understanding and living the life in somebody else's shoes. So these are the two books that I, I definitely recommend if you are teaching a gender course. And the way to convert this online, I think it would work best if you have a distance synchronous course where you do need to log in and Zoom with your students. Um, you can encourage them to dress up, but you still could play this game. You could design, you know, the back could be Greenwich Village for you, right? And you can do all sorts of things with this online as well and getting students to work together. You can put them in breakout room sessions where they can sit there and, you know, discuss and meet with their factions. So there's a lot of ways to convert this to um, an online format as well. And of course, you are assigning the roles, which is wonderful too. So you will get to know your students in those first couple of weeks when you are lecturing on very specific components. And you'll start to see like, okay, this one student's a little bit more conservative or this student's a little bit more liberal. I like to flip the roles for them because I want them to see um, the other side of the story essentially. So again, not all of us have time to give up seven or 10 weeks, right, in our course, but I highly encourage you to look at the website, which I can definitely give you, and take a look and see all the different micro games, because you can take pieces of this where you might have your students dress up for two sessions instead of for seven weeks and not have that main victory goal, but you could have mini goals for your students to incorporate as far as role playing. Other types of role playing that I tend to do in my classes, um, one of the role playing I'm doing this semester is I'm teaching courts. And in our courts class, all of my students, and they're actually currently signing up as we speak, uh, they are going to take on one of the current U.S. Supreme Court justices. So what we will do is we will have mock U.S. Supreme Court sessions, and we're doing this all online. And what I love to do is I love to bring and incorporate other faculty in, as well as alumni. So I have two faculty members from the English department and a faculty member from political science, as well as an alumni from political science, a student, who are going to come in and act as the defense and prosecuting attorneys for my students and they are going to do oral arguments and argue why my U.S. Supreme Court class should hear the case or not. So this is after, you know, obviously time spent discussing with them. But what I do with something like this is I tie several assignments to this type of project. So essentially um, the first assignment that they're starting to work on now is once they get assigned their U.S. Supreme Court justice. And again, I encourage my students to really specifically find someone that they their political ideology is different as well as gender 
And so what's great is I'm seeing a lot of my male students signing up for Ruth Bader Ginsburg right now. And I'm seeing a lot of my female students signing up for like Brett Kavanaugh or Neil Gorsuch, which is amazing. And so they'll be in groups. It's a 36 student class. So they'll be in groups of four, right, with nine U.S. Supreme Court justices. But right now they're working on diving in um, once they get assigned to that specific person. So they're going to learn the ins and outs about this person, um, where did they go to school? How did they grow up? Um, what, you know, types of cases do they tend to side with the majority? Or what cases do they do in terms of concurrence or dissenting opinions? Anything about their home life, their current life now, their process going up to the U.S. Supreme Court who appointed them. And so they're answering a series of questions based on this person. And I title it role research assignment to get them ready and excited to take on this role of somebody else. And so I really find that when I do assignments like this and role playing, there's always opportunity for assigning students a different gender or race. So for example, I have female white students signing up for Clarence Thomas, which I think is awesome because it gives them another perspective to kind of take a look at. Another assignment that I do in my criminal law class, which I'm doing this semester for the first time online, <laughs> is a um, mock trial. So we have a murder on campus, quote unquote, and I teach this class concurrently with my criminalistics and forensics course. And so my criminalistics and forensics students that are also taking crim law concurrently, the semester I have four, they actually would be collecting evidence and things of that nature, and they will serve as the expert witnesses in the trial. So they'll pick out one type of expert witness. And what I love is usually there's a good amount of women um, that are taking both concurrently. And I love to give them the types of unit analysis individuals that tend to be male. And I think that that's important for them to see that they are also capable of having this type of position. And then as far as the courtroom work group goes, I love to make sure that some of my women students are taking on um, attorney roles and that they understand that they absolutely can go to law school and become an attorney. I do the same with various ethnicities in my classes. I tend to have mostly um, white students and we do have more female students than male. However, we are starting to see a larger Latinx population. So I love when those students want to take on one of these roles and I try to make sure when they sign up for their top three, I encourage those students to look into these roles. We also have a jury and we also have press. Um, I have bailiffs and what's kind of cool is we have an IU cadet program. So we have both women and men students who go through this training if they apply and get in and they wear their full-on you know cadet uniform when they act as the bailiff which is awesome. So students take on these roles and I encourage um, I'm encouraging them right now for this online session to think about what type of dress would they wear when they take on the role and how would they present themselves and I had a student um, who literally wore a suit and bought a briefcase to act as the lawyer which I thought was really awesome of course I don't require them <laughs> to do that but um, definitely I get them engaged and this absolutely can be done online I am testing it out and I will let you know how it goes but for all the lay witnesses and um, one of my expert witnesses, I, in, I recruit faculty from around the whole college, from all our different um, schools, so College of Health and Sciences, business, and they come in, and they're like so excited to be a witness, but they come in, and they actually um, are witnesses, and so my defense and prosecuting students will speak with them ahead of time, and what they will do is they will prepare them, right, for taking the stand, and so we are going to do this through Zoom, and I will let you know how it goes, because this, this is going to be the first time, and I'm, I'm a little concerned. One of my favorite assignments, and this assignment can be incorporated in all types of classes to have gender and race in your courses as well is I will give my students at the beginning of the semester an assigned person. So for example, I might give a student who's assigned as a transgender female, they are 25 years of age, they are Chinese, 
they have no contact with their family, no mental health issues, um, has severe asthma, uh, served five years in prison for possession and intent to distribute heroin, um, is uh, addicted to cocaine, uh, received drug uh, education but not treatment in prison, right? And they're just released from the state of Indiana with $500 to their name. So I'll start them off with something. And then what the student has to do is I'll give them assignments like every week or two weeks, depending on how large the class is. And they basically have to um, try to find certain things throughout the semester. And usually I will tie this to prisoner reentry. So the first assignment, for example, will be related to finding housing. So living as this specific individual, um, you, they have to actively look at the laws in the state that they are assigned and they have to find where they can potentially live and what actual apartments are available and do the apartments or housing say that if you have a criminal background of drugs, for example, you cannot live there. And so they'll do different types of assignments. I tackle um, housing, I tackle employment, um, family ties, mental health physical and both um, physical health and substance abuse. And I want them to really take on that person. And then what I do is in class, we do required therapy and that's from their parole officer, right? So what I'll do is I'll assign different individuals that are taking on a different race or gender or um, component of that nature and they'll be in different groups and they have to actually discuss the issues that they've had or any positive impact they've had for each of those assignments and so they'll discuss with each other and then what they'll do is they'll present for each other of the issues so for example if Danielle was in my group Danielle might present for me and talk about the issues I faced as a transgender male in the state of of Tennessee and what I've been dealing with, right? So I love doing that. And I think you can easily convert this assignment to online for any of your learning management systems. They can submit the journal assignments through um, any of, like I use Canvas, so they can submit that through. You can set up Zoom, required Zoom meetings where you put them in breakout rooms and they can do their therapy sessions there. And then you can come back as a class and cover this. Um, so I do, I love doing that. And then what I'll also do is I'll throw additional insulin incidents along the way. So for example, what I might do is I might make part of the class experience some type of victimization. And then I might make um, another part of the class commit, you know, another criminal act while they're going through prisoner reentry. And so I'll add little kind of obstacles along the way for them to kind of figure out, well, what do I do and how would I do this? And it really gets them understanding what an individual in a different gender, in a different race, and someone who's been um, incarcerated, what they're actually going through as they're struggling through and going through these barriers to reentry. Students love this. Um, and what I do instead of a paper, because traditionally, traditional papers can be boring, is I make them do kind of like a role reflection assignment. And I do that for my courtroom and I do that for my US Supreme Court class as well. So what they'll do is they'll reflect on and I give them kind of like a couple of different questions to think about and then want them to expand on their own of what they encountered. Um, Sometimes um, students will go as far as like calling up apartments and saying, I'm a transgender, you know, female, even though it's a, like a male student and say, you know, and this is, I committed this crime, can I live here? And it's really interesting to see what happens when they actually contact people and what these individuals say to them. So I kind of have them take on a different perspective. And what I love the most about this assignment is when I do get the reflections back, it's the students that have always viewed incarcerated individuals as just criminals who deserve to be locked up. When they are writing this reflection and they say that they see these individuals in a different light and they're not using the word felon anymore, or the word inmate, they're saying incarcerated individual and, and saying that they want to do some sort of reform, right? I love that. That's what makes my heart happy. 
So this assignment can be done in a race and crime course as well. You can take away the release from prison. So what you can do is assign individuals um, a particular race, age, background, type of job, um, amount of money earned per week, a family situation, um, any type of mental health or physical health you want to assign them, and then do your incidents along the way, which could be done with a victimization course. Um, it could be done with a career course as well. The last type of role-playing assignment that I really find to be fun and effective is debate. So what I'll do is I will pick a particular topic, um, something that was discussed in lecture, but not I didn't get too in-depth in it because I want students to do their research. And in this case, it would be what? Online video lecture. And I'll assign individuals a particular stance. I'll assign them a particular gender as well as race, and I usually incorporate a location. So the location might be um, a PTA meeting, um, it might be a community forum or town hall, uh, it could be a protest, so like in front of, you know, this political building. And I try to select controversial topics, so students um, are going to have their own perspectives, but they're taking on the role of someone else. So they almost have to put those perspectives aside and view it from a different standpoint. So one example is I'll do like a PTA meeting and zero tolerance policies or gun policies. Um, I also have done drug policies. I'll make some sort of incident happen that I announce to the class. So I'll say, okay, school shooting, or I'll say, um, you know, drug bust at, you know, Merkville High School. I usually create some random high school with my name. And then what I'll do is have the students then debate. So they'll come to the next class after doing some research and debating as the person they are assigned. So for the PTA, I usually will say, okay, you're all parents, right? They're, if I'm gonna do that one, I'll make them all parents. And then I set up like a little podium for them, although online, you know, I'm gonna tell them just to use a pen as like a microphone. And um, they get to speak and argue their perspective based on the individual they are assigned, the role they are assigned. Um, for neighborhoods, sometimes I'll do like for uh, community forum or town halls, I'll do some sort of like increase in a specific crime. Uh, with protests, I usually incorporate some type of CJ policy, so some type of social event. Um, so Megan's Law, residency restrictions, um, Black Lives Matter. I'll even throw in um, anti-Black Lives Matter because I, I really want students to understand everything in terms of these components but so with like sex offenders for example what I might do is say a recently released you know uh, sex uh, sex offender previously convicted sex offender has just been released into your community and now you know based on who you are let's come together and have this discussion in our community forum and so different things like that. Um, when I do the protests, I usually have students make signs that are for their particular topic. Um, of course, what you can do with COVID-19, I like to check in with my students to see what resources they have. And so I've kind of tweaked this where they can make a poster that is from like Google Docs and, and use Google, you know, types of photos and images as well. For students who are living on campus and have a bit more access, I tend to try to assign them roles in which I know that they can go get some items for free on campus and they can use those, um, and especially now if they're feeling comfortable for doing that. All right, so let's take a look at some media-based assignments. So the first type of assignment that I use, and I use this in my Myths, Issues, and Realities course, is what I call a journal entry. Um, I do teach a unit on race and crime in this class, and I also teach a unit on gender and crime. So we talk about the various myths that surround gender and crime. We talk about the various um, issues as well as realities, and we do the same, um, all three topics for race. And so what I do is I provide my students at the beginning of the semester with a list of TV shows, and it's approved list of TV shows. I also include um, free TV 
access websites. There's a couple out there where they can access some of these shows. And on the list, I'll put next to them what topics they'll find for that particular show. So for example, Law and Order SVU is one of the shows and our students love those types of shows. Um, there are some really great transgender um, hate crime episodes on that. And I'll also um, put down, you know, women, um, gender issues and crime. I'll put down race and crime. Um, there's a couple of other shows, like for example, when I do corrections, I will put Orange is the New Black, I will put Oz, I put Wentworth, um, so they can look at that from both a gender as well as race lens. And so what they'll do is they'll pick um, one of those shows. So let's say a student wants to cover transgender issues. They'll pick um, transgender issues, they'll look at which um, types of shows connect with that. And then I recommend that they look at IMDb and look up the synopsis for each show. And once they find an episode that they want to watch, they'll watch the episode and they get a series of questions. So they have to summarize the show, of course. But what they'll do is they'll have to pick out at least two or three myths that they're seeing based on what we had discussed in class in the readings about transgender hate crimes. And then they will pick out two or three realities about that particular um, hate crime if we're doing um, transgender hate crimes. And we do the same for policing, we do the same for race and crime, gender and crime, all sorts of topics. And what they'll talk about too, which I really love, is they'll, they'll also write about do they believe that this particular show, this episode, is detrimental to society, to the general public, based on the amount of myths that were in there and like lack of truths. And what I love is students will say, Dr. M, man, you know, Criminal Minds, I love that show. And now I dissected it. And now I like, I'm so mad at them. You know, what, why did they do that? And so it's kind of funny, but, um, and I feel bad for them. But what I have them do is, as an end component for that assignment is they have to create kind of like a message that they would design to go at the beginning of that episode to warn individuals and the general public about potential myths in that episode. And I do this with movies as well. Usually the movie is more of an end project where students pick a topic. Um, uh, just I've had various ones done. American History X, a student did on the issues of race in prison. Um, I've had uh, students do Gone Girl, where they've looked at the criminal as the other, and they focused on um, this female, like, you know, beautiful woman being this, this criminal, and automatically she has to be crazy, right? And they focused on those myths as well. So it definitely can work for any type of online component. Again, they can turn in the journal entries um, absolutely through any type of assignment you have on learning management. And again, if you want um, any information about the types of shows that I do or like a list, um, I know a lot of my students have Netflix and they have Hulu and Amazon, but for the students that do not, there are free websites which I can easily send those to you as well if you're interested. A second type of assignment that I do is the social media assignment. Um, I love incorporating social media and doing kind of like a mini content analysis. And usually it's on a particular topic. Um, I learned real quick that apparently our students are not into Facebook anymore. Apparently that makes us an old person. Um, and so I started looking into Twitter and became more involved in Twitter recently. For those of you who know that I, I'm on your Twitter now, but um, I recommend using Twitter or Instagram, and I also make them do Facebook. But what I do is I allow students to pick a topic from an approved list of topics. So, for example, um, it could be um, like if when I teach with race and crime and teach about that in a unit, um, I've had students choose to research political officials' comments on black males and crime. Like that was their topic. And so what they do is throughout the whole semester, they'll spend a couple of hours a week and they'll have their particular social media. So they decide if it's Twitter, if it's Facebook, Facebook, if it's Instagram, and they'll go through and they'll document what they're finding in relation to their particular topic. Um, of course, we've seen comments by individuals recently who like to go on Twitter, right? So I definitely
recently have had students pick um, and look at like negative images of women in uh, political a political capacity and so that's been one um, topic I've had students look at you know um, issues um, discussing transgender rights on social media and so I had a student do that on Facebook which was really really interesting and so what they'll do is they'll write a summary analysis um, of what they found so they'll do very brief assignments for this over the semester and then at the end of the semester they will write a proposal on how to change social media platform in regard to their topic and what they found and how best to approach these sensitive issues throughout the semester um, and I've had um, individuals look at like negative images so not actually written words but negative images about women on Facebook and so they went through and tried to find things and they would search and e the the sad part is is a lot of these students actually find it on their own friends um, pages and so that's one learning lesson that they've found is that wow I'm actually seeing this you know with people I know maybe I need to rethink my friends which you know I tell them that's totally up to them um, but there's a lot of ways to incorporate um, race as well as gender doing an doing an activity like this even in um, you know another class that's not specifically titled gender or race you can do this in a variety of courses um, it, it could be anything crim law courts corrections and so forth there's plenty of ways to kind of move around in terms of this assignment now a quick note just about grading rubric issues for active learning what I want to really stress is you know there are students that we have that are very shy um, they're very timid naturally they're just naturally an introvert and then of course we have those outgoing and really you know extrovert type of students um, I think it's important that when you do any type of role playing to keep in mind that those shy and timid and introvert students are doing something like this probably for the first time. And so because of that, um, what I like to do is I like to kind of watch those students a little bit in terms of how much they start to open up and participate over the semester. So in terms of like, the courts or my criminal law class, the students that are a little bit more timid and a little bit more shy, um, once they start digging into the role and seeing other people doing it, what I notice is they start to participate more. So when I'm grading them, I'm definitely not comparing them to those you know, A students who are just like all in you know, and, and doing everything. I'm looking at their specific progress starting from the beginning of the semester all the way through. So for me, raising their hand more and like actually speaking in class is to me that speaks volumes for these types of students when they're taking on a role playing type of um, opportunity in a class. So I'm not saying to be completely subjective. Obviously you want a grading rubric that everyone can fit, but I think putting something on there, not necessarily saying for shy students, but something on there about like progression from the beginning of the semester all the way through, having some points for that, taking into consideration those students who are not necessarily um, the most active, but then they're starting to work toward that. So what I do with those students is the first time they start to feel a little comfortable and maybe they spoke once in class during that role play, I will send them an email like for that first assignment that they submit or, or do in class and I'll, I'll let them know like that was awesome sauce. Like I'm so proud of you for doing da 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 da. Keep it up. They love that. That's rewarding language. And what I see is then they'll raise their hand a little more, right? And they'll do a little bit more. And so I feel like it's important to understand when you're incorporating this type of pedagogy that there's a diversity in your students in regarding to their learning as well as their personality. So that is something that I really like to overall look at. Um, and in a nutshell, I do follow the good teaching is one fourth preparation and three fourth theater and that just comes from my background and works for me. Um, I think all of our students are so lucky and 
that they have such dedicated professors and instructors like us who are all here, some of us doing all day sessions and wanting to make learning as best as possible, especially during this time that's very trying for them. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. I would love to open it up to um, discussion and sharing of ideas for anyone who has any questions. Yes, Erin. Hey, Stacy. Thank you so much. I uh, This teaching has taught me that I know nothing and that I really <laughs> need to learn a lot to be an amazing educator. Um, I'm really interested in your debate and role playing aspects of your class, How, but I often teach a 200 seat gender and crime. And I love that class and I don't ever want it to go away. So I don't think I would ever self select into a smaller class. I just love it so much. Is there a way where I can incorporate it in my class where not everybody is role playing? Because with 200 students that would that may get out of hand. What you could do, I think, is you could probably set it up for different periods of the semester where part of your students are going to take on and do some role playing and the others will act as observers. And what I've done in my class when I've had larger classes is I give an assignment to the observers to kind of take note on what they're seeing and what they're learning and, and what they're getting from their other classmates. Is there anything? And these are usually private, so I only see the observations but almost think of it as like when we're peer observed essentially but in a way that like they might tell me you know because I'll ask the question of um, what would you do differently or what what is something that you saw that you would like to incorporate in your role from another individual in the class and what's helpful is I make them use the name of the student so in a 200 like for you in your case for me it's been like 65 or 70 but they start to get to know other people's names which is really really helpful you could even do this one thing I learned um, from the mosaic Institute I was a mosaic fellow and it's all about active learning is when you have a 200 person class um, there's ways of like when you split them up into groups you can and give them little things as far as like, okay, this group's gonna work on this today, and this group's gonna work on this today. And then you do a color coordinated kind of like post it, although on online you might have to, we'll think of something differently, but like yellow would mean we're still working, so give that group time. Blue would mean like we have a question, and like pink would mean we're done. Right. And so I've I've done that before. And granted, it wasn't 200, but it was about 70 students, which for me was a lot. And so I find when I do that, I'll just give them different activities to do. But I definitely think you could split up like this one fourth of the class is going to role play and then this the rest of the class is going to observe. And so everyone's doing an assignment. It's just not all role play at the same time. I love that idea because it also doesn't put too much pressure on students who don't feel comfortable speaking in public. Um, exactly. and, yeah, love it. Um, would you share your syllabi with me? Um, sure. So I don't have like, I usually on my syllabi give very brief information about the assignment because I love to discuss it in class. Um, but I can definitely share, um, you know, I can get like my assignment sheet and things like that and send that out if you want, definitely. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. Perfect. Any other questions? Of course, let me give you guys, I'm gonna put my email in here um, for everyone. And then that way, just email me because I will forget. Literally, this is like the fifth Zoom thing I've done today. And this is a fabulous you know, time to do a presentation, but my brain is fried. I'm sure all of yours are too. So I'm gonna put my email in, in here. And that way, just email me and say, hey, you know, can you share such and such? I'm more than happy to do um. so. Also, <laughs> sorry, I have a child here. Um, we're, I'm going to, Stacey, I'm going to have all of the presenters send me their stuff. If oh, perfect. You sent to put it on the DWC yeah. website. Yeah, I'll make a note of that. So that way I can do that and you can share. Sure. Okay. But if all anyone right. wants to email me too, just about yes. anything else, you're more than welcome to. So I just wanted to put that out there since I came late, um, that I am going to create um, on the DWC website. Perfect. Okay. Any other questions about role playing or m incorporating media? 
um, anything or even, you know, something you want to discuss about maybe you have an assignment and want to think about how to add a media or role playing component to it. I'm more than happy to um, brainstorm with you. Do this in a mid-sized, completely asynchronous chorus. Okay, so what what are you thinking about? And okay, so 30 to 40, and which type of assignment are you thinking about? The courtroom work group or Supreme Court. Okay, so perfect you bring that up. So my courts class and my criminal law class have 36 students um, in both. And so what I'm doing online is when we do our required Zoom, oh, so you're doing asynchronous 100% completely. Okay, so for asynchronous 100% completely, what I would probably do, um, it's a little bit difficult because they're not really like performing, but you might want to adjust the their role research assignment. And you might also, um, I know for asynchronous courses, a lot of times you can have your students record. So you might want to think about having them, um, maybe if you give them some sort of like, okay, you're Chief Justice Roberts, and here's the case that's going to come to you after they've done their role research, maybe have them do like a voice thread or a voice recording. I use voice thread um, for my classes and students love it because they can hear each other. And so when it's a fully online course, Course. I've used it before. Um, they like to hear each other speak. So you could probably do voice thread assignments that you can tailor around um, the different characters that they would play. I hope that helps. We can brainstorm a lot more though, because that's a, that is a toughie with when it's 100% online. The voice thread is fabulous. Oh, oh, it's fabulous. I, except the first week of this semester where it just, part of my French, I, I'm a sailor, but it was a shit show. Um, otherwise it's been, you know, great. But yes, um, this first beginning of the semester, I wanted to kill voice thread and the people that work there. So I, I spent six hours back and forth with them. But yeah, it does work now. Thumbs up. Any other questions? Oh, I've done a lot of it is. It is less intuitive. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or thoughts? I know I um, I did a similar assignment for corrections, which sadly I'm not teaching anymore, but I did a similar assignment where I had them all split up and basically be juries on a death penalty case. And I had Great. them do different cases with different um, victim and offender characteristics and then come back with their decision. So they had two class periods to mull it over. And it usually got really intense in the classroom, honestly. Like you could hear people really going through some of this stuff. And then they were always shocked because almost always the actual outcome is different in the real case than what they come up with. And so sometimes they're like, we're sure that this should not be a death penalty, you know? And so that was kind of something, that's the only time I've done something like this and I was so nervous, but for people who are on the fence, I had the best reviews from that particular activity. So I thought that was really cool. And this is definitely making me think of ways I can incorporate it to the class I'm teaching now, since I'm not doing corrections anymore. Yeah, so that's the wonderful part about it is you can totally incorporate um, any of these types of assignments. They do not necessarily have to be in like a crim law class. So teaching like voir dire, for example, if you're teaching that in any of your classes, you can, I did an activity once in a completely separate class where I had students take on the roles of the defense and prosecuting and all that. Each group was either a prosecuting group or a defense group. And then I had people take on the role of the jury. And, but what I did was with them is I didn't let them be themselves. I gave them a, a, like a printout of you're for the death penalty, you're 68 years old white male, you're this, this, and this. And so when the different groups were practicing voir dire, they would ask a question and it would always shock them as to what their classmate would say. Cause it would be like my, you know, woman student who's black saying, you know, I'm for the death penalty, let this person fry. Like they would say something random and everyone's like, but that's not what you say in class normally, you know? And then they realize, oh my gosh, Dr. M gave them roles. Like they're playing. So you can do something like that too, to kind of teach certain, you know, different types of areas. And I think it's so much fun and they love it. Like they love it. Yeah. 
So does the role play, and it, sorry for my name, but I'm very naive when it comes to this. I've never done anything like this, this in the classroom. Does the role play come later in the semester? And are you kind of building the foundation for their, for not only their, their specific role, but their education like throughout the semester? Like how does, how does it kind of build up and culminate? Yeah, it depends on the class and the assignment. So for example, when I do the journal type of assignments, like in my Women in Crime, and I will give them their character and everything like that, that happens in the very, very beginning. Um, and I've done that also in like a corrections course. So that's helpful too, is like they'll get, like you're just released from prison. They'll get that in the very beginning. And then, you know, I'll incorporate lecture, but I'm more of like, a, I want to hear what my students think. Like they can read the book and we can talk but like let's talk about these issues and so that starts in the very beginning and then what they do is they build on as we progress and learn more material the assignments get a bit more trickier I throw in those incidents and things of that nature and so they're they're doing it throughout when I and like reacting to the past I would say starts pretty early you you would do a couple of lectures to get students kind of ready for that environment and then that one would start almost immediately after after like two weeks um, for the US Supreme Court and for the, uh, court, the trial class, those students um, are working on role research throughout, but they're really taking on their roles toward the end of the semester. So it could be either way. When I do the miss issues and realities, we're talking about so many different topics that they are able to kind of take on and do some of those things throughout, but it's not like the full semester. So it just really depends on the class and what you want to do with it because something like this can be really intimidating if you've never done it before. So I always recommend like baby steps, try it out in one of your classes, but try like one assignment and see how it goes. And then if you really like how that one assignment went and your students loved it, put two more in the next semester you teach it and kind of build from there. So do you, you don't do really any lecturing then in your classes? It's mostly like discussion seminar style? Mm. I do, I do lecture because we're technically required, right? So I do, I do lecture, but a lot of the time when I lecture, I'll only lecture for like 10 minutes, then I'll ask questions, then I'll incorporate some sort of activity, then I'll go back to lecture. And so I break it up. I don't do your standard, like, I'm going to talk the whole time. And I put that in my syllabus and I tell my students like flat out, if this is not the type of class for you, I'm totally fine. Like you can take somebody else, but you're gonna do a lot of talking, you're gonna discuss, because I tell them that no matter what job they go into the field, whether it's a police officer, lawyer, victim's advocate, you have to be able to discuss, you have to be able to speak. And I also tell them that they're gonna write a lot because every degree is a writing degree. So like I, I flat out am like, hey, I'm blunt, but I think that's what my students appreciate is that I'm so honest with them up front. And so they like it, they like the debate, they like the, they don't wanna sit there for you know 50 minutes and just see PowerPoint after PowerPoint. So I break up the lecture. Um, essentially. Obviously in COVID, I've got several different videos that they're watching, but when we do our Zoom sessions, I'm not lecturing. We're doing activities just like I would do in class. Yeah, I, I love it. I love that. And that's what I've been trying to do this semester where all of my lecture comment, co my, all my lecture content is pre-recorded and uploaded to YouTube. And then we use class time to have like seminar style discussions. Exactly. Um, I have received a little bit of pushback though, that it's more work than when they just have to come to class and listen to a lecture. And so I'm trying to navigate that right now as we talk. Like, oh, you want me to watch the lecture on my own time and then come to class and talk about these concepts? <laughs> For some students, they love it and it's been very successful, but I am getting a little bit of pushback. Like this seems almost like double the work. And you're teaching in person, right, Erin? It's hybrid. And it's so, hybrid. Yeah, so, but I am in the classroom, um, you know, I am in the classroom. It's just that we have less students in the classroom now. Um, but I was just, yeah, so that was my, that was what I was wondering is, you know, 
yeah, just give them more work and the student and they do benefit from it. So, right. And the thing is, is you're kind of doing like a little bit of flipping the classroom in a sense, if you think about it, and it always, there's always resistance for students with flipping the classroom. So that's actually very common um, to see that resistance. Usually it's because students are so used to like all of their courses. Think about it, like math, English, all of those courses are doing your traditional lecture. But then when they come to like us who want to do something different, they're so confused by like, wait, wait, I was supposed to watch and now I'm just going to talk like I don't have to listen to a lecture it throws them off so I think that when you tell them at the beginning and say hey this is going to be kind of flipping the classroom this is what we're going to do then the students that are not interested in that format they're not going to take the class and you know what so be it but then what they're going to do is they're going to hear from all their friends how cool the class was and they're going to resent not taking the class, right? So flipping the classroom, I would say, I've done it a little bit. I'm always nervous about it, but I think that with flipping the classroom, it there is resistance at first. So to me, that's totally normal. Good to know, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts as we come to toward the end or sharing of any assignments or anything? Well, if not, um, oh, thank you so much. If not, then, you know, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I'm gonna figure out, this is my first time recording, so I'm gonna figure out how to stop it and send it to Shelly. <laughs> and hopefully thank Shelly you so will help much, me. Stacey. You're thank so you, welcome. Stacey. Thank you all for having me. I'm, I'm so appreciative of Division of Women in Crime. Yes, and I will Thanks. be emailing you. <laughs> yes, email me, definitely. Okay. We have to talk about California, so yeah. yes. Thanks, Absolutely. Stacey. Thank you so much, everyone. So Shelly, do I just hit stop recording hit stop. and then where does it go? <laughs> it should go to your cloud. Oh, because I did record on the computer. Is that what it oh, is? Oh, um, then. <laughs> it's going to give me a link, I think. <laughs> It'll, it should Hi. give you a link. <laughs> This is why I had the video off. Um, yeah, it should give you a um, it should give you a link.